Okay, now I'm going to attempt to share my screen. And then I'm going to look to my colleagues to see, can they act, give me a thumbs up if you can actually see stuff. Great. Thank you. All right, everybody. Um, I'm Carmen DeJovene. I'm the director of the Assistive and Rehabilitative Technology Certificate Program. I'm um, really excited to have everybody here and uh, excited to give you an overview session on this um, new online certificate program. So to start off with, um, I just want to talk about the mission of the program, um, the mission of the certificate program when we were developing it. And in our mission or our goal for the students is that at the end, they'll be able to use assistive technology to improve the quality of life for individuals with disabilities. And I'll even go a step further to expand that to assistive technology and rehabilitative technology. And I hope you see that theme throughout this, um, throughout today's presentation and also throughout the curriculum. Um, I think it's very important to have a good idea of where you want to go. And, and this, is, um, this is our mission in terms of informing students as they um, work through the certificate program. So we'll start off with a, a little welcome. Um, usually I would say at this point, yeah, if you need to use the washroom during this presentation, you can go to, and of course, given that we're in this online environment, I don't have to have to do that. Um, my daughters would say that was a bad dad joke. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, for from a logistic standpoint, um, the webinar will be recorded. All attendees will be muted throughout and then just use the chat window for questions. Um, I will be stopping twice during the presentation to answer questions. So um, if you want to ask questions during the presentation, that's um, totally fine. And we will be answering them throughout. The other, um, however, if you want to wait till the end, that's fine as well. So our agenda today, we'll start off with uh, introductions, then we'll talk about uh, what is assistive technology and rehabilitative technology. Um, I know for some of you that may be on the call, um, that may be something that you're very aware of and you've been and uh, you've heard many times before. Um, but for other individuals who aren't familiar with this, we thought we would level set around what are these things that we're talking about in terms of AT and, and RT. We'll talk about the program design and, and curriculum. So what classes are involved in it? Why did we develop it the way we did? What was the rationale for putting the certificate program together? And then finally, we'll um, talk a little bit about the logistics of the application process, what the tuition looks like. And because we have a graduate program and an undergraduate program, who would want to take courses um, in each of these areas? And then at the end, we'll end with a question and answer session. So first, we'll start off with our esteemed uh, presenters. Uh, myself, I'm Carmen DeJovene. I'm the program director for the ARTC, or the Assistive and Rehabilitative Technology Certificate Program. I've been at Ohio State University for 10 years, almost 11 years now, and I'm an associate, uh, associate professor with a clinical um, appointment. Um, I also work in the Assistive and Rehabilitative Technology, sorry, I also work in the Assistive Technology Center I'm on the clinical side. So I get to work with um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech language pathologists on a, on a regular basis. So I'm gonna turn it over to Amy to um, introduce herself. Thank you. I am Amy miller Sentog, and I am a speech language pathologist. I have been working in the field and with people who need augmentative and alternative communication for more than 20 years now, um, or close to that start to lose count. And I've been at OSU for about five years, and I am really excited and proud to be part of this certificate program. Great. Thank you very much, Amy. And now we'll turn it over to Lisa Tarek, um, who will introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Tarek. I'm the Director of Student Services in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Um, I have been at the university for over 15 years in various administrative positions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lisa. And finally, we'll have Matt Nellis um, introduce himself. Uh, Matt is the Regional Director of Operations for National Seating Mobility, and he's actually, you know, 
it's great that I'm here and Amy's here and Lisa's here, but I think it's actually most important that Matt's here because he, he provides the perspective of a potential future employer and talks about the big picture of why there's a need for assistive technology professionals in the field. So Matt, if you mind introducing yourself. Sure, thanks Carmen. So I would be the one person that again, doesn't work for Ohio State. So I'm, I'm kind of the outsider here. Um, but as Carmen said, my name is Matt Nellis. I work as a regional director in our operations for National City Mobility. So we're a provider of, of the rehab uh, equipment uh, that the clients see throughout this facility and others. Um, I've been in the medical industry for close to 20 years and uh, the last almost five now with National Seating. So I'm super excited to be involved and I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you all this evening. Great, thank you very much, Matt. We're really happy to have you here today. So Matt will be talking a little bit um, later on in our presentation, giving you a little bit more background. So in terms of level setting around what is assistive technology, um, assistive technology is services, devices, strategies, and practices that are conceived and applied to improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. And the thing, the reason this is important for the curriculum and the reason this is important for the program in general is that we don't just focus on the shiny devices um, because those shiny devices are going to change over time what we really do is we focus on the services, strategies, and practices. How do people use them? How do professionals who are getting into this field identify what is the most appropriate um, assistive technology for an individual? And how do they work with the consumer to working together as an interprofessional team decide what is gonna be the technology that's gonna allow them to perform the activities that they want to perform in a day, on a daily basis. And so just to get a sense of, of what does assistive technology look like, I mean, it, you know, the World Health Organization talks about assistive technology from the highest level that includes any type of technology that supports an individual with dis disability, um, which also includes orthotics and prosthetics. For the purposes of this curriculum, we focus on all assistive technology except for um, orthotics and prosthetics. So the picture that I have in front of you in the upper left-hand corner is is equipment that are, is devices that are used in, in worksite accommodations. In the upper right hand corner, we've got a picture of individuals using um, manual wheelchairs. In the lower left hand corner, communication. In the lower right hand corner, it's the Internet of Things, um, what we also call environmental control units or um, electronic activities for daily living. And the um, the important part, and the reason I have the young man in the middle is the important part is how do we bring all these pieces and parts together? And, and that's the important part of, of this course because the young man in the middle is using a head control to control his wheelchair, to control a computer and control a communication device. So you're gonna hear this theme um, off and on throughout the, the presentation today. I then also wanna talk for a second about rehabilitative technology. And rehabilitative technology focuses on, so it has a similar definition as assistive technology, but it focuses on the assessment, implementation, training, and follow-up processes. So just like we have technology that improves the quality of life of individuals with disabilities, we also have technology that helps the clinician, helps the teacher, helps the engineer make decisions about how they're gonna use that technology in the real world. And the important part of all this is that this all fits into a process. So you're going to hear me talk throughout about the, the process and the strategies and the way that people use technology. And so I just have a, a closed loop or a closed circle diagram showing that we start at the top with assessment, implementation, training, follow up and follow along. And the rehabilitative technology helps the clinician, helps the consumer make decisions throughout this process. And we could easily use this closed loop system or this circular diagram to describe the engineering design process. So it works both in the clinical sense and in the, um, and in the engineering design sense. And as a couple examples of rehabil rehabilitative technology, um, I have on the far left an example of a pressure mapping system and so that gives us a sense of how is a seating system working for an individual. On the right, I have an example of the uh, smart wheel, which allows us to measure how a person is propelling 
their wheelchair. So the important part is not the smart wheel itself, it's the, port, the important part is that we're taking the time to measure how a person is propelling a wheelchair and using that information. And then in the middle, at the top middle, is a picture of the compass system, which is a system that allows us to measure how a person is accessing their com computer or communication device. And so we use these types of things to help inform us to make the best decisions in terms of how, what type of assistive technology an individual could use. So I'm gonna pause here for a second. This is my first pause. See if there's any questions or if um, Matt or Amy have anything that they wanna add at this point. Oh, I'm good. Carmen, there are no questions in the chat box at this time. Great. So I'm going to jump into why in the heck did we create this program? Why, why did we start this? And so there were two problems that we saw um, and that I've seen throughout my career that I felt like needed to be addressed. Um, the first one is around technology integration. So I have a picture up here of a wheelchair, a power wheelchair. It doesn't matter what kind it is. It just happens that I have a, a permobile. Um, M3 power wheelchair. Wheelchairs in their inception were all about mobility, but today they do so many more things. So this power wheelchair can control other devices within an individual's home. Um, the individual who is using this device, he actually controls it with head controls. And so there's this idea of how do you figure out what controls do you want to use? What technology do you want to use to integrate with everything else? And then you start thinking about technologies that aren't necessarily traditionally thought of as assistive technology. And I've got a picture up here of the Cadillac Super Cruise, which is a step in the direction of autonomous vehicles. And so you can quickly think, how can we take autonomous, the technology out of an autonomous vehicle and add it to a power wheelchair to make it easier for an individual to use that power wheelchair? So those are some of the discussions that we have throughout these courses. The other thing we do is we talk about how can a person that's using a power wheelchair access a vehicle. And so this once again gets us in that idea of how do we integrate these pieces and parts together. And the final piece that I have up here is um, smart, Samsung Smart Things. And it's to represent the Internet of Things, um, smart home technology. Sometimes we talk about it in terms of environmental control units. And so once again, how do we incorporate what a per, the activities that a person with a disability wants to use within their home, how do we incorporate that technology into their own devices to make sure everything works together? And that's really the focus of this whole curriculum. When we start, I'm gonna talk about the individual courses later on, but it's all about how do we incorporate technology that's considered medical technology with technology that's consumer technology, and then bring it, bring it all together. The second problem that we feel like is the big problem is how do you become an assistive technology professional? Um, that's a question that throughout my career I've been asked often. And I, th I feel like that this program addresses that. So traditionally people end up in this program or in assistive technology in this field through serendipity. That's how I accidentally went to a presentation that had uh, about a new technology that was coming out to make um, kiosks. So this, I'm aging myself, but to um, automatic teller machines for banks, how to make them accessible. And I'm like, hey, this is a really cool area of interest. It's through grassroots. You know somebody else who's in this field and they say, hey, come join us. And the last piece is that it's a, the education system around assistive technology is piecemeal. People pull courses together um, throughout, the, um, throughout their professional career to learn more about assistive technology. And we wanted to address all three things. And there's actually, we're not the only program that's trying to do that right now. And, and we're doing that by creating a certificate program that allows an individual, allows a student to take four courses and get up to speed and get themselves ready for the assistive technology professional certification exam. So, our solution is the Assistive and Rehabilitative Technology Certificate Program. The goal of the program is to educate health science, engineering, rehabilitation counseling, and education students and professionals 
on the application of science and technology for improving the quality of life of individuals with disabilities and older adults. And as you can see, there's that mission statement coming into what we're trying to do. And you can also see the interprofessional nature of assistive technology and rehabilitative technology, which makes this field so much fun to get into. So before I go into the courses that are in the, um, in the program, just wanted to see if um, Matt and Amy had anything to add at this point. Okay. Oh, no, it sounds great to me. It, right. One thing, Carmen, I want to touch on, you know, I think is the problem number two that you mentioned and, and how significant um, you guys are in creating the certificate program. There is an absolute, uh, just a, a gap of qualified folks um, going into this field um, because it isn't a typical traditional course plan. Um, and so in today's environment and in our um, kind of ever-changing landscape, um, uh, from a professional perspective, there are going to be a lot of opportunities um, in this field um, with, with the aging population uh, exploding and the folks, fortunately or unfortunately, depending upon the viewpoint of, of the need for what we all do, um, is growing exponentially, but those who serve them um, hasn't, hasn't kept up with that. So um, it, it is, I guess, by all accounts, speaking from a business perspective, a good problem to have. But again, having the opportunity to, to take these types of courses um, and get a head start on um, the certification process is, is tremendous for the folks to take advantage of it. Great. Thank you very much uh, for adding that piece, Matt. Um, I think it's a really important part and it's the um, part of the, it's the story that I've been hearing from a, a number of individuals is they can find, um, they can find potential em employees who have an engineering background or have a health science background, but don't, the engineers don't have the health science and they need that part or the health science, the individuals with the health science background don't have that engineering or technology background. So this certificate program addresses that. Carmen, um, we have a question in regards to, would this certificate help a disability career specialist to better prepare to help individuals and in jobs? Yeah, um, yes, that's a great question. So one of the, the one of the hard parts about putting this program together was um, identifying all the people that could benefit from this. So from a, a disability specialist part, when I think of workplace accommodation, um, Resna has um, and the job accommodation, the people who work in the job accommodation network out of Georgia Tech have been involved in, in the development of what technology will support individuals in their, in their workplace environment. So the certificate program would help you by giving you that broad knowledge, which I'm gonna talk about in the introduction to assistive technology program or intro to assistive technology um, course, but then you could identify areas of the um, certificate program that would also support finding the technology that would allow an, uh, an individual with a disability to either go back to work, go to work for the first time, or to keep their job. And we've been um, involved in that aspect um, at the Assistive Technology Center. So they parallel each other quite well there. Okay, so um, I talked, that was a great segue because it gave me a chance to talk a little bit about the introduction to Assistive Technology course. Um, that intro course is exactly what it sounds like it gives a broad overview of all the areas of assistive technology and really focuses on the um, steps in identifying um, appropriate technology for an, an individual and it also focus on the steps of implementing that the training that goes into that the follow-up that goes into that process and um, and it sets the framework for the remaining courses so we have specialty courses the first one is computers, communications, and controls. So that gets into um, the internet of things. It gets into robotics. It gets into um, what are called zero effort technologies. So, um, and it gets into a little bit of remote monitoring. And then the second course is AT for seating and mobility. And the third course is AT for sports and recreation. And I feel like those are pretty self-explanatory. I'm gonna turn it over now to Amy to talk about uh, an upcoming course that we're really excited to, to bring on board. 
Thanks. I am, was finishing the syllabus today and actually got really excited, especially with that question in the, in the chat, adding in um, a section on how people with AAC can use that technology to have employment or in other recreation information uh, or ability to participate in recreation. Because one of the important things about AAC is that we really know the reasons we communicate and why. And I think with AAC, a lot of the times we focus just on your wants and needs and that's really important, but communication is really about social connection. And we do that in so many ways, not just talking to someone face to face, but being able to use that same technology to write an email, to use that same technology to post to Instagram and take a picture with the device and possibly even being able to drive your wheelchair or having the switches in your wheelchair control the device and how it all hooks together. And I think this is uh, in a really exciting time where it's getting more feasible that we can connect all these things together and still provide someone with effective communication. And especially for people who are not literate or may lose their literacy skills with disabilities as they um, potentially have a stroke or traumatic brain injury and how we can best set up the foundation of how should information be arranged and how should vocabulary be organized on a communication device to facilitate that effective use in all different settings and even controlling the Samsung smart home and Alexa and all of the other internet of things that that is available. It's really exciting. Thank you, Amy. And, and I, there's a, one point that Amy talked about that I want to highlight. And, and that point is that she was talking about stuff that happens in other courses within her course. And, and so one of the things we've been cognitive about, cognitive about is trying to identify ways to loop the same concepts into multiple courses to make those connections. So it's not just you take one course and then you're done. You take one course and you apply it again and you apply it again, which hopefully makes it A, a better experience for you, but B, more importantly, will hopefully make it easier for you to then leverage it in the real world, real world and see how those applications can actually benefit you as a professional and the individual with a disability. Um, the last course that we have coming online in the, um, at the end of uh, 2021 is Games for Health Promotion and Rehabilitation. And so that's a course that we look at the importance of uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, and game theory in uh, health promotion and rehabilitation. So I just want to quickly say, um, give you an idea of what the curriculum can look like. It can be taken in 12 months, it can be taken in nine months, um, and it could be extended into 16 months, depending on how you, you want to tailor it. But to start off with um, a 12 month curriculum, you could start in the summer, take a course in autumn, and then be done with the courses by spring, get through um, all four courses, because there's four courses for, um, to get the certificate. The nine month curriculum, you would start in autumn, take intro to assistive technology, computers, communications and controls, and then finish up with two more of the specialty courses in the spring. Of course, as I mentioned, you could extend that over a longer period of time if you only wanted to take one course per semester, but that's way you can get through the whole curriculum in uh, nine months. So, I have this slide up of who is our customer. And I think I use the term customer um, because uh, I started a company uh, about in 2006. And so I'm really focused on who is the customer. And most places talk about the students as their customer. Um, and, and the student is the core. This doesn't happen without the student. I also thought about the employers and the graduate and professional schools as our customers, because we want to create, we want to give the students the best opportunity to be successful when they get their jobs or in their current jobs, or if they want to go to graduate school and professional school. So we look at all these individuals as our customer moving forward. Um, in terms of the types of students that we imagine um, coming through this program, we expect we anticipate non-degree seeking students, undergraduate students, and graduate students. And then we expect people from a, a plethora of, of fields to, to come into this program. And I'll talk a little bit more about the different types of um, 
the different pathways through the program in terms of uh, non-degree seeking undergraduate graduate later on. Um, but now I'd like to turn it over a little bit to Matt. So I'm putting Matt on the spot here just to, to let everybody know because he's a, he's a great sport about this. Um, just to talk about um, some of the opportunities. What, what does it look like as an ATP or, or what, what are some of the opportunities um, for somebody that's interested in this field? Sure. So, you know, our industry is, it, it's really, in many ways, um, I'm going to sound a little bit odd in this, it's kind of broadly narrow. So it's a really small industry. To give some perspective, um, the CRT or, or complex rehab technology industry that, that my company is a part of um, is, is really a subset of the durable medical equipment industry, so the DME. DME is only less than roughly 2% of Medicare, which is driving the bus from a, a payer perspective in our industry, um, uh, given that a large number of folks that are served through, through what we do um, are of Medicare, of Medicare age. And again, that's a growing population. So it's, it's kind of a small industry, but it's broad in the sense of the number of opportunities that are available. Historically, as, as Carmen said early on, we got folks who... Um, sort of fell into this business. They may have been a respiratory therapist or their mom needed a wheelchair. So they went somewhere and got one and then realized there wasn't anybody to help uh, take care of them. Um, there wasn't enough um, proper equipment and they learned on the fly. And next thing you know, uh, they own their own DME company. Um, and, and to that end, or just, just us alone, we've got a significant number of of our ATPs and we employ at NSM probably around 420 or 430 ATPs um, across the US and Canada and, um, and a significant number, probably 40% or higher have been in the industry for 15 plus years and are in the next probably five years approaching their retirement age. So, so not only as a practicing ATP from a provider perspective are there great opportunities, um, but we, we, not just my company, but our industry also has ATPs that are working in the supply chain side of things. So working directly with the manufacturers, of course, working for the manufacturers to give the clinical and engineering perspective on how things should be created. Um, the payer relations side of things um, or lobbying, which is kind of an ugly word, um, is, is incredibly significant. Part of uh, what Carmen mentioned in sort of that problem number one uh, about technology, the technology in our industry has outpaced the payment side of this, has outpaced the legislative side of this, probably fivefold. There are technologies that are created that help not only individuals with uh, better mobility, but improving their, their, the things they're doing every day, but in increasing and improving their dignity and self-respect. And many of those technologies are not uh, paid for by the client's insurance. So it leaves this gap of things that need to be paid for. So um, folks coming into this industry with an understanding, uh, you know, in the ATP side of it can help educate payers, can help edu educate legislators um, and really advocate on behalf of their clients um, and our patients, which is exactly something you do in the healthcare segment, right? Uh, therapists and, and nurses and doctors are, are advocates for um, for their patients. And that's, that's something that is, uh, is widely available um, for what we do as well. So it really is kind of a broad spectrum of, of areas where there's availability and, and opportunity. And it's, as I mentioned, it's growing um, exponentially um, in terms of, of where the opportunities are um, within what we do. And, it, and it's not just a mobility perspective, as, as was mentioned before. Um, aging in place is a term now, which is uh, individuals who want to remain at home as long as possible. So what does their environment look like? We're, we're no longer looking at um, how do we help the individual with uh, their mobility need, but how do we help them um, through, as you saw through these courses, um, how does that integrate with every other aspect of, of their, their life? How does that work in their home environment? Um, what does their home environment look like? How can that be adapted for them to be safe and, and comfortable there? How do they get to and from the doctor? So looking at, at transportation needs, it's really a broad based um, industry and, and having an understanding as an ATP um, gives you a foundational uh, level um, knowledge that is, uh, is incredibly valuable in, uh, 
uh, across the, the entire spectrum of, of this industry. Great, thank you very much, man. Um, you, do, you know, the two things I wanna highlight is that you talked about was the, the broad um, spectrum of even if your primary focus is on mobility, that mobility has to interact with everything else. So you need this broad base, uh, broad based understanding of assistive technology. And the second thing is that I heard was the interprofessional nature and the um, and the ability to work with people in, in very different fields because technology affects individuals with disabilities um, across all settings. And so that was um, really cool. So thank you. And Amy, is there anything that you want to add at this point? No, I, I'm really excited, Matt, about all the things you talked about. And it's I just get excited to see all these things coming together in one program because I think a lot of it, the experience in my career has been um, piecemealing together. Uh, and so it's, it's very exciting to see this. Thank you very much. So I just want to um, finish my part um, today, just talking a little bit about Resna. Um, I've been a member of, of Resna uh, for well, since 1994. So however long that is. A long time. Um, but one of the questions I get is, um, will this certif certificate program um, decrease the amount of work experience that you need for the rest of certification? So the assistive technology professional certification and the seating and mobility specialist certification. Um, it, it won't decrease the work um, hour requirements. Um, what it will do, will, it will prepare you to take the exam. Um, it'll prepare you, when we built the curriculum, um, Resna puts out a, a guide of what is on the exam and we use that information to help us develop the, the program. So it will help prepare you for that, that component. Um, there's two components to the certi certification, a work component, um, an education component, and then the um, test itself. And this will help you with the test. The second piece is um, I get asked, are we accredited by Resna? Because you can get a, a schools can get accredited by Resna now. Um, we are not at this point, but that is something that we are looking forward to in the future. The exciting thing for me is that there are three programs that are accredited. They take very different tax than we do to provide the education. Um, and, and I'll, they're University of Pittsburgh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and University of Illinois, Chicago. And you would think I wouldn't want to talk about them, but I'm actually very proud of the fact that there's some organizations that are that some institutions that are able to take that um, leadership role and start the accreditation process. And so we'll be looking to them to help us um, develop the, um, get accredited for our program. So I think I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa at this point. Great, thank you, Carmen. We actually have um, two questions. I was wondering if you thought maybe um, you could address them now or if you'd like to wait. Um, the first one is in regards to the actual curriculum of the AT program, um, ATC program. Um, can you test out of any of the courses such as the intro to athletic training? Um, or do you need to take all of the courses uh, to actually get the certificate? Yeah, that's a, a great, great question. Um, the way it's set up right now is that you have to take all, you have to take four courses to um, complete the certificate program. Um, that, that doesn't mean that um, you can't, if you feel like that there's a course that um, you already uh, have that knowledge around it, um, that, that you can't take the other courses. The, um, the courses are um, available on an a la carte basis. The nice thing about the certificate is that it makes it much easier when you're um, trying to demonstrate to other individuals, other external individuals, namely a future employer, um, about the type of um, education that you have and why you would be the best person for this job or the best person for a new role within your organization to have that complete package through the, the certificate program. Um, the other thing that we were thinking about in terms of this was we wanted more than three um, specialty courses so that if you were, um, already had a, a good base of knowledge and let's say um, augmentative and alternative communication or seating and mobility, you would have other options in terms of courses to take. 
Perfect. Um, I think the next question um, would be, uh, this would be a good place to ask it. It says, can you talk a little bit more about the types of jobs you could get with an ATP certificate? And then the follow-up is, is there a national exam that needs to be taken at the end of the course, uh, the coursework to get the certificate? Okay, so yeah, two, two great questions there. Um, the first question around the types of jobs. Um, we have Matt uh, on, the, on the call to talk specifically about the role of the um, complex uh, rehab technology suppliers. It's a mouthful. Um, specifically, um, ATPs who are working in the seating and mobility realm. So that's more of a, a, a combined sales and um, identifying um, the right technology for an, an individual. Um, the other um, areas that we often see um, individuals getting jobs in are clinicians who want to work in an assistive technology center. So then that way that demonstrates that they're um, a clinician that has more experience. So an occupational therapist, physical therapist, speech language pathologist in, in a given area. Um, the other one is I find our um, individuals who want to work for manufacturers. So one of the interesting things is um, I've seen this uh, in putting this program together, um, been following what's going on online. And I've seen a lot of requests um, for looking for um, people who can work for large corporations, such as a Microsoft and Apple um, and Amazon in terms of their um, working in their accessibility division. Um, I've seen it from um, Disney actually has internships around this. Um, and then I've seen it in terms of manufacturers of assistive technology who are specifically looking for people, looking for engineers that have that clinical background or have more of that health sciences background. And they're also looking for the health science individuals who have a little bit of technology background so they don't have to train them up. And then they would, could work in, an, in a sales position and when I say sales, sales and assistive technology is not about going out and pitching to companies. It's about supporting the clinicians that are working with and the other professionals that are working with the individual with a disability. Um, so that's some of the examples of types of technology. And then what was the second? Um, the second one, one was, is there a national exam that needs to be taken at the end of the coursework to get the certificate? The, so there is a national exam. Uh, Resna um, is the one that administers the exam. It's the assistive technology professional um, exam. And, uh, and it's an exam that um, you take at a, at a testing site. Um, that's just one of three pieces that are necessary to get um, the certification. And, I'm, and I just want to be clear that the Resna certification is separate from um, our certificate program. So you can complete, you'll complete the certificate program and you'll have a, I want to call it a diploma, but you'll have a piece of paper for the, the certificate program. Um, and there's not an additional exam that's required for, for that aspect. We have one more question before we jump into the um, difference between the undergrad and the graduate certificate. Um, Bethany would like uh, you to talk a little bit more about the work experience that is required to take uh, the ATP certificate. Can you sure. speak a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, the work, the amount of work experience is tied to the type of job, um, the types of job, oh no, sorry, let me step back. The amount of work experience is tied to um, your educational experience. So the more educational experience you have, the less um, time you have to spend in term, in, to meet the, the work requirements. So that's the first piece. And I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. So I recommend going to the Resna Assistive Technology, uh, the Resna ATP website. The second piece is that you have to demonstrate that in that work experience, that um, that work experience relates to assistive technology. And um, in my experience, a lot of people think that that means high-end assistive technology, that you've worked in an assistive technology um, center. And, and that's not the case. People, work, people that are working with individuals with disabilities 
naturally are working with assistive technology on a regular basis. It can be low tech or high tech. It doesn't have to all come from um, working in an assistive technology um, center. And so the thing that you have to do is tell that story when you're applying for the, cert the certification. Tell that story that, yes, I've worked so many hours in this area and this is how I interacted with assistive technology and it may be low technology or high technology. Wonderful, thank you. Um, thank you to Amy for providing links um, to the ATP certificate um, and regarding the work hours and um, the exam. Uh, we'll go ahead. We had a question about the application process and that's gonna be in the next couple of slides. So we'll go ahead and uh, talk about that now. If it's okay, Carmen, I'll go ahead and uh, speak a little bit about the differences between um, the undergraduate certificate and the graduate certificate. Um, there are differences in regards to which one might fit um, an individual in regards to your education. Um, those that are high school graduates who may have some or no, none uh, college credit, um, or for those who have actually completed a bachelor's degree may be more interested in the undergraduate certificate. Um, this could also be applied to those that are currently employed as um, rehabilitation technicians or technologists, or if you're looking to become one. Um, and then for those undergrad uh, students who are currently enrolled in an applicable program, we listed a few there, engineering, um, health sciences, or health-related special education type programs. Um, if this is something that is of interest and they can see the future um, of the certificate, um, the undergrad certificate would be, be best designed for that. For those that um, are looking at the graduate certificate, um, this is gear geared more towards uh, individuals who are currently enrolled in or may have graduated from a graduate or professional program. Um, maybe those that are thinking about going on uh, for graduate education after their baccalaureate degree. Um, a graduate certificate would also be appropriate um, as a post-professional certificate to set yourself apart in a current job or maybe uh, in a future um, position that you are thinking about. And then the certificate is also uh, applicable to current graduate students, again, in an applicable um, program, such as engineering, something in regards to uh, health or health sciences or a special ed program. The curriculum, though, is different for the undergrad and the graduate program. The course numbers are the same, um, but the outcomes and expectations will vary um, in regards to those taking it as an undergrad um, and those taking it as a graduate certificate. So um, I'm going to ask Dr. DeJovene to talk a little bit more since he's designed the classes um, in regards to really what separates the um, curriculum um, from those that are in the undergrad um, versus the graduate portion. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, so for both undergraduate and graduate students, um, we focus on a, a broad base of topics. So we're, we're trying to get to um, a threshold that everybody um, could, would be prepared to take the um, ATP certification exam. The graduate student, the thing that they get is we have an understanding of, um, or an expectation of that that individual um, has experience as a um, clinician or as a engineer or as a health science and and what we do is we take that experience and apply it in, and build it into the course so the example i like to give is that we have um, a number of discussion posts throughout the course they're case studies and we have the um, undergraduate students start off the discussion of this is where they're at in terms of understanding um, the the goals of the individual with the disability and the background of the individual with the disability and then we have the grad students jump in as mentors to help support the undergrads. And the reason we do that is because from a metacognition standpoint, from a standpoint of what allows you to learn best, is there's an expectation that the grad student would be able to teach a little bit and be a, help those undergrad students 
um, develop their skills um, and to leverage the graduate students experience. The other thing we do is we have a higher focus in terms of evidence based practice and the application of evidence based practice. So that's really what um, sets the undergrad courses apart for, or the undergrad sections apart from the grad sections. Everybody is in the same. I want to make this distinction, everybody is in the course together. They're all working together. It's supporting each other. Um, that makes it a better experience for all the students that are involved. Great. Um, also too, um, if you would advance to the next slide, um, the admission requirements are um, slightly different uh, in regards to applying to the undergrad certificate versus the graduate. Um, for the undergrad certificate, um, if you do not have uh, college coursework, um, an earned high school diploma is required. Um, and then if you do have some um, or you completed a baccalaureate degree, a minimum 2.0 GPA is um, also required. And then I've um, also attached the uh, link to the online undergraduate application um, for those interested in this uh, undergrad certificate. Um, we'll go on to the graduate. It's a little more complicated, so I apologize for all the text. Um, it's to be eligible for the graduate certificate, um, one must have um, graduated from a baccalaureate or a professional degree. Again, like we mentioned, it can be in um, you know, any program that's applicable for the certificate. Um, the GPA requirement is a little bit higher at a 3.0 cumulative on a four point scale for the last degree that was earned. Um, so if that would be for those individuals who may have completed their um, undergrad um, and are looking to pursue um, additional education at the graduate level. There is also eligibility for those students that are currently in um, a graduate program um, at The Ohio State University. Um, and again, there is a minimum 3.0 GPA. So I know we have a couple um, students um, who are interested in graduate education and going on for the certificate. So the latter uh, would be the requirement in them for those individuals who have, may have been um, out of school for a little bit and are looking to go on into graduate education. Um, the eligibility is the first one. Um, not to make things a little bit difficult, but there are the two application um, pathways. Um, if you are a degree seeking student at The Ohio State University, you would complete a graduate uh, intra-university transfer application, um, not the actual um, graduate level application that those that are not currently enrolled at Ohio State um, would complete. So again, if you have any questions in regards to uh, what application is best to complete or which um, certificate level undergrad or graduate that you would have, please, please um, reach out uh, to either myself or Dr. Giovanni, and we would be more than happy. Um, I'm kind of more of the nuts and bolts, so if you're having um, any difficulty locating the application, I would be um, very happy to assist you with uh, locating the correct application. All right, we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about the application deadlines. So um, we um, are actually still accepting applications for our autumn 2020 start. Um, the deadline will be uh, July 15th of 2020. The application itself um, is not complex in nature. Um, there are requirements uh, in regards to providing a statement based on um, the question um, that is posted on the application. Uh, you will also be required to upload um, uh, a CV or a resume so that we can see the types of activities and, and experiences that you um, have been doing um, throughout your career. Um, and then I believe there's also um, an activities and uh, an, kind of an activity sheet um, portion where you can also add um, additional um, experiences and activities that may not be um, on your resume. And that is um, pretty much the application alongside some uh, 
uh, biographical uh, demographic information that's required. So it, it really won't be that difficult. However, we do have step-by-step um, -step instructions on our website um, that could help you. But again, if you do run into any difficulties, please um, feel free to reach out to me and I will um, assist you uh, with those questions. The nice thing about the um, certificate program is that we have rolling admissions. So we will be doing um, um, admissions every semester. So the next one after autumn will be spring of 2021. And that deadline will be November 30th of this year. And then um, we will continue along in the summer of 2021 with a, a deadline of April 1st. Um, we usually do post um, future semesters, um, at least two semesters in advance. So we'll be posting our autumn 2021 deadlines here um, in a little bit, but uh, there's definitely many opportunities to apply um, for the certificate program. And then another um, area where you may see some difference um, between the undergraduate and the graduate certificate is in tuition. Um, because this is an online certificate, you will be paying um, tuition for online um, for online education. Um, as you can see, and um, let me just go ahead and explain um, the the second. Um, row is the total estimated cost for the certificate after or taking in the four courses um, that are required and each course is um, at three credits so um, if you look at instructional fees general fees the distance learning fee and times that by um, I believe four, if I, I did the math a while ago, you'll get the 5692. But that would be the total cost for Ohio residents for the undergrad um, certificate. If you are out of state, it would um, slightly just a little bit higher at 5732 for the undergrad. Now, graduate education um, across the board uh, is higher than an undergraduate um, tuition so we're looking at for Ohio uh, residents completing the four courses will be at 9344 um, and there's just a slight difference for um, non Ohio residents. So if you, again, if you have any questions um, in regards to um, tuition, the application process, um, admission criteria, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I think I went ahead, uh, we had a question in regards to what is the cost. So um, I went ahead and uh, explained that um, there. So if, if there are any other questions before we get into the Q&A, which is right there, um, please go ahead and submit your questions using the chat function. Dr. Giorgini, did I cover everything? Do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> that was great. Thank you very much. Um, hey. And I'm pulling up the chat window here. So we've got what is the cost? Um, I think we answered the application process. Um, question. So it looks like we have all of the chat questions answered. Am I seeing this correctly? Oh, um, we have another one that says for OSU employees, do they cover the cost of the certificate? Um, from what I have gathered, um, they will. I would speak with your um, HR representative for your unit to ensure um, that um, you know, how the process is, to my knowledge, it's automatic that once you register for the classes that the um, system identifies you as an OSU employee and um, does go ahead and um, process your tuition payment. I would just definitely work with your HR representative to ensure that um, there aren't any additional steps. Um, I believe that per semester, they, the um, university covers up to 10 credits, which is Obviously, um, um, the certificate's 12, so you would definitely be within that realm, but that's uh, 10 per semester, so you should be okay. Great, thank you. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I, I'd like to say uh, 
Thank you to um, Matt for uh, joining us today. I really appreciate it. And of course, um, Amy and Lisa, um, this is uh, now our second go around with this. So it's, uh, I feel like we're, we're actually uh, getting this <laughs> down pat. So this has been great. Um, and I appreciate everybody um, staying on the call today, um, joining us today. And once again, um, I'm just gonna flash up here the, um, my email address. Um, is carmen.dechovene at osumc.edu. Um, and then our general mailbox is um, HRS certificates at osumc.edu. And that's if you have specific uh, questions. And um, if you just want to use the HRS certificates um, at osumc.edu email, um, Lisa will route any questions um, to me. So if you want to use that as a generic one. Hey, Carmen, one other question popped up in the chat. Yeah. Um, is the undergrad certificate program a benefit to me if I already have the RESNA ATP certi certification? Um, so it's not a benefit in terms of getting, obviously getting the certificate, uh, the certification. Um, where it can benefit you um, is and this is my personal opinion is is twofold the first one is it'll help you with your um continuing that so you can use it for your continuing education requirements um the second thing and i think maybe the more important thing is that the atp certification is um, a minimum threshold it's it's that minimum threshold to participate um as an atp within the assistive technology community community um, these courses definitely go above and beyond that. So um, the courses will allow you to take that next step in your professional, um, whatever position that you're in, um, and to whatever you think that next step would be within your within your organization, or um, within another organization. And depending on the work setting, um, people in public schools, you might be able to use these credits in this certificate program to move up on the pay scale in terms of you didn't go and get another advanced degree or another degree, but you have some level of additional education that helps bump up the scale. And I haven't worked in the schools or talked to an Ohio schools person in a while to know exactly what that is, but there are some options if you're in the public school system to leverage something like this for increased opportunities that in your job, but also for increased dollars in your paycheck at times. Thank you, everybody. Well, at this point, we'll uh, wrap up. And uh, thank you once again for uh, spending your evening with us. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. All right. Okay. All right, Carmen. All right. I think I got to figure out how to stop, stop recording. There we go. Okay. Oops.